Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome to the live Facebook on this special episode uh, associated with Farhat Zahra. Now, we have been uh, wearing black and commemorating the tragedies of the Ahlul Bayt for days and weeks. But the 9th of Rabi al Awal um, marks the milestone of where we take off the black and we put on our bright colors and we all join uh, in festive parties and celebrations at, at the Husseinia on Farhat Zahra. But what is behind this Eid? What actually happened on this day? Why has it caused some controversy? Inshallah, we'll discuss this and much more with Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Banju. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Nah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. As'ad Allah ayyamana wa ayyamakum wa yakdi Allah hawa ijana wa hawa ijakum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and increase your happiness on uh, this uh, auspicious days of Eid. Um, starting with the celebration of Farhat al-Zahra on the 9th of Rabiul Awwal. Days of happiness and Eid celebrations up to the 17th of Rabiul Awwal that marks the birth of the Grand Prophet of Islam Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam, and his grandson the master of the age, master of this madhab Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq Sallallahu wa sallamuhu alayhi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our happiness during these days of Eid and fulfill the du'as and the hajat of all mu'minin and mu'minat. Shaykhna, how important is this Eid? I mean, is this Eid used as a milestone to end our season of grief, you could say? Um, is, is that why it's so important? In regards to how it is perceived today from a calendar perspective in that we begin mourning for Ahlul Bayt from the beginning of Muharram all the way until the 8th of Rabiul Awwal that marks the martyrdom of Imam Hassan al-Askari salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh and the very next day you have the ninth day of Rabiul Awwal. So from a calendar perspective, this Eid has this sort of fragrance attached to it that it is the day of celebration after an extended two plus months, two months and some days of mourning and we have narrations in itself by Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi wa salam hu alayh where he specifically mentions this day 9th of Rabiul Awwal as being the day in which the black clothes are removed. For everything within the Sharia, even historical dates and historical occurrences, they take place and fall on certain days, not out of coincidence, but there is a hikmah ilahiya, a divine wisdom behind everything that happens, even from a calendar perspective. Alhamdulillah wa shukar. MashaAllah. So what did actually occur on, on these days? Then? Huh. In regards to the importance of Eid al-Ghadir, and uh, before we touch into what exactly happened, the importance of this day, the importance of 9th Rabiul Awwal, what is, what is the divinity of this day? Or if you could put it in another way, what are the fada'il? What is the fada'il of this great day of Eid, 9th of Rabiul Awwal, most famously known as Farhat al-Zahra? Yes. Within the hadith Mu'tabara, you find that Amir al-Mu'minin salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi describes this day of Eid, 9th Rabiul Awwal, Farhat al-Zahra, describing it with 72 different names. He conveys this message and, or he relays this information for Hudayfa, al-Yamani, companion, Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And he mentions to him, Ya Hudayfa, that I know for this day 72 names. Wow. And 72 days, the 72 names given to this one single day of Eid, each one of these 72 names reflects a certain divine, grand and auspicious element of this day of Eid. Mm -hmm. And you find that in comparison to all the other days of Eid, there is no single Eid within our tradition that has been granted so much importance and been blessed 
in such an intense manner, no other Eid, not Eid al-Adha, not Eid al-Fitr, not even Eid al-Ghadir. Wow, you find that 72 elements are given, dimensions through which this 72 different elements of the grandness of this Eid. And let me read you some of these 72 titles from these 72. Let me read for you some that will give you and give our blessed viewers a glimpse of the greatness of this day of celebration and why we celebrate it. Hadith is from Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi speaking with Hudayfa, part of the hadith which is mashhoor. From the names that is given to Eid al-Zahra or Fatah Farhat al-Zahra, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Yawm al-Ghadir al-Thani. The ninth of Rabiul Awal is Eid al-Ghadir al-Thani. The second Eid al-Ghadir. The second Eid al-Ghadir. So from here, straight away we understand that Eid al-Ghadir or the event of Ghadir in itself is made up of two parts. Indeed. One part is the 18th of the Hijjah and the second part is the 9th of Rabiul Awwal. And within this there is Kalam Kabir. There is great words and there is great interpretation in regards to the similarities and the conjunction between the 9th of Rabiul Awal and the 18th of Dhil Hijjah, such that the Eid of 18th Dhil Hijjah is completed with the Eid of 9th of Rabiul Awal, and the 9th of Rabiul Awal is completed with 18th Dhil Hijjah. The one who celebrates the 9th of Rabiul Awal is because he has understood and accepted 18th Dhil Hijjah, and vice versa. For you find. Amir al-Mu'mineen states, 9th of Rabiul Awwal, yani Yawm al-Ghadir al-Thani. In another description, Yawm al-Raf'ul Kalam, the day the pen is raised, okay. and there is tafsir about this. Mm -hmm. Yawm al-Baraka, the day of blessings. Yawm al-Tharat, this is the day of vengeance. Oh, okay, interesting. Yawm yustahab fihi dua or yustajab fihi dua the day where duas are accepted. وَيَوْمْ نَزْعَ sawad نَزْعُ sawad what you were elaborating to edge. It is the day of removing the black clothes. يَوْمْ نَدَامَةُ ظَالِمْ the day of regret for the oppressor. يَوْمْ فَرْحُ shia the day of happiness for the shia. وَيَوْمْ قَتْلُ الْمُنَافِقِ The day where the Munafik was killed, sent towards Jahannam wa بِئْسَ الْمَسِيرِ يَوْمْ حَدْمُ الضَّلَالَةِ This is the day of the destruction of misguidance. And you find that, so on and so forth. يَوْمْ نَسْرُ الْمَذْلُومِ This day, 9th Rabiul Awal, is the day of victory for the oppressed. Each and every one of these names highlights a certain particular dimension of this great Eid Farhatul Zahra that occurs on the 9th of Rabiul Awal. This is in regards to the importance of this day. When you come and you ask in regards to your question, what exactly happened on this day, 9th Rabiul Awal, Farhatul Zahra, why do we celebrate it? What is the reason for this commemoration and this grandness? Ahna, Habib Sayyid Mohsin, we have hadith. Okay. Hadith is Sharif, which is narrated to us on authority of Imam al Askari, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi. And this narration is mentioned in a number of books. And let me just say to you exactly in this regard. I will narrate for you the importance of this day, what happened on this day from the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam himself, which he conveys to Hudayfa. And he says within this two points, because the hadith is grand and the hadith is long. He says to Imam Hassan and Hussein, yani, and Hudayfa is listening, he says, so we understand number one that Rasulullah celebrated this hadith or this Eid Afwan. 
and he's celebrating it in regards or in the form of a prophecy for a grand act that is going to happen years later on this day. The Holy Prophet says, إِنَّهُ الْيَوْمَ الَّذِي يَحْلِكُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ عَدُوَّهُ وَعَدُوَّ جَدِّكُمَا وَيَسْتَجِيبُ فِيهِ دُعَاءِ أُمِّكُمَا Rasulullah says, this is a day of barakah. Haniyan lakuma bi barakati hadha al-yawm. Congratulations to you on the grandness and the barakah of this day. Why? Because indeed, today is the day that Allah shall perish or Allah shall destroy or chastise his enemy. And the enemy or the enemy of his prophet. So today is the day, 9th of Rabiul Awwal marks the day of divine chastisement. Who is being chastised? The enemy of Allah and the enemy of Rasulullah. Ba'ad, وَيَسْتَجِيبُ فِيهِ دُعَاءُ مِّكُمَا Today is the day that the dua of your mother was granted and accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. Which dua? Dua in regards to the chastisement of the enemy of Allah. The question also is which mother? Which mother? Yani the mother say the Fatima the Zahra alayhi salam ba'ad. And hence it is known as Farhatul Zahra. The happiness of Zahra, the celebration of Zahra. Why? Because the enemy of Zahra, whom Zahra alayhi salam did dua against, this dua was actualized on the 9th of Rabiul Awwal. Ba'ad. And Rasulullah goes on to describe this. فَإِنَّهُ يَوْمٌ يُفْقَدُ فِيهِ فِرْعَوْنَ أَحْلَ بَيْتِي وَظَالِمُهُمْ وَغَاصِبُ حَقِّهِمْ Today is the day that the Fir'aun in regards to my Ahlul Bayt, the Fir'aun of the Muslim Ummah, the one who shall oppress them and the one who shall use up their rights shall be destroyed. Yani the Fir'aun of the time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam describes the killer of Sayyida Fatima al-Zahra as being a Fir'aun. And few sentences before that, the enemy of Allah and the enemy of Rasulullah. So, in short, when you say what happened exactly on this day, this is the day that the Fir'aun of this Ummah and the killer of Sayyida Fatima al-Zahra left was killed and it marks the beginning of divine chastisement. Like the way Amir al-Mu'mineen said, the day where misguidance was shattered. And hence, it is a day of celebration from this perspective, a day of grand celebration. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, just to let the viewers know that we are taking phone calls in today on this, uh, this evening's episode. If you have a question that you would like to direct to the Sheikh, please call us on 0203 515 and inshallah the Sheikh will be able to answer your question. Sheikh, now, on this, you know, uh, as you were discussing in regards to uh, you know, Farhat al-Zahra and the 9th of Rabi al-Awwal You gave us some hadith Is there any other specific hadith to do with the 9th of Rabi al-Awwal and, and the Eid of, of Farhat al-Zahra? The Eid, Farhat al-Zahra alayhi salam We have a tradition And you find that this tradition I will read out for you parts of it And this way we can get a glimpse In regards to what is the masdar of this Eid what is the proof? Was this celebrated during the time of the Imams or not? You find it from this narration, which is narrated uh, by Muhammad ibn, Muhammad ibn al-Ala al-Hamadani al-Wasiti and Yahya ibn Muhammad ibn Jurayh al-Baghdadi. Both of them say that we had a dispute over a certain topic, over a certain issue. And in order to resolve this dispute, 
we went to the house of Ahmed ibn Ishaq al-Kummi. Who is the companion of Abil Hassan al-Askari? Abil Hassan al-Askari, yani Imam al-Hadi. Both Imams are commonly known with the title al-Askari. Yes. Imam Ali ibn Muhammad al-Askari. And we have Imam Hassan, Hassan ibn Ali, Ali al-Askari. Al Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari. Yani both 10th and 11th Imam. So he says, we went to Ishaq. Ibn Ahmad al-Kummi, who was the companion of Imam al-Hadi in the city of Qum. We knocked on the door. وَكَرَعْنَا الْبَابِ فَخَرَجَتْ إِلَيْنَا صَبِيَّةً إِرَاقِيَّةً مِنْ دَارِحِ And he says there was a young Iraqi girl that came out of the house. So we asked her. فَسَأَلْنَاهَا عَنْهُ We asked the girl, where is Ahmad ibn Ishaq al-Kummi? So she said to him, "Huwa mashghulun bi'idihi fa innahu yawm Eid." She said to him, "He is busy celebrating the Eid. He is preoccupied yes, in celebration." So look at what the Hadith goes on to say. "Fakulna yani these two people." He said, "Subhanallah, al ayad ayadu shi'a arba al adha wa al fitr wa yawm al ghadir wa yawm al jum'a." So these two companions got shocked. <laughs> they said, Baba, we have... They didn't say Baba, no, I'm just... You know. <laughs> they, okay. said, you say, they said, Subhanallah. They said, Subhanallah. Eid, what do you mean an Eid? Yes. Us, the Shia, we have only four Eids that we know about. We know about Eid al-Adha. Oh, we know about Eid al-Fitr. We know about Eid al-Ghadir. And we know Jum'ah is day of Eid. Which other Eid came on top of this? And... <laughs> on this day, Qalat, she said, فَإِنَّ أَحْمَدِ بِنْ إِسْحَاقِ يُرْوِي أَنْ سَيِّدِهِ أَبِي الْحَسَنْ عَلِي بن مُحَمَّدَ الْأَسْكَرِي أَنَّ هَذَا الْيَوْمُ هُوَ يَوْمُ عِيدِ وَهُوَ أَفْذَلُ الْأَعْيَادِ إِنْدَ أَحْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِنْدَ مُوَالِيهِمْ She replies back to them. She says, Ahmad ibn Ishaq narrates on authority of his master, Imam al-Hadi, that today is a day of Eid. Rather, it is the best of all Eids for their Ahlul Bayt. And they didn't say, Wali Shi'ati li Muwali. For a Muwali and a Shia, there is a great difference. In terms of daraja, in terms of alliance, in terms of affiliation. La, she said, Muwali, everyone and anyone at any different level of Iman, even the levels of Iman lower than the Shia, it is taken as an aid for them. So the hadith goes on to say, Kulna, fasta'adhini lana bidduhul alayhi. She said, ask, him for per ask permission from him so that we can come in and tell him who we are. She says, she went and she told Ahmad ibn Ishaq who has come to the house. And Ahmad ibn Ishaq came and he welcomed them. And we said to him, Kulna. Awahada Yom Eid is today the day of Eid. Wakana Yom Tasi' min Shahri Rabi al Awal. This is today the day of Eid and it's the day of 9th Rabi al Awal. Kala Naam. And then the hadith goes on to say that he welcomed them to the house and he went on to say to them, Ahmad ibn Ishaq al Kummi. He says, just like that, I will paraphrase the bits of the pieces. He says, just like the way you all are coming to me. He says, I, with a group of people, ma'ajama'ati ikhwati, with a number of my brothers, kama kasad tumani bisur man ra'a, just like the way that you have come to me, I, together with my brothers, we went to Surman Ra'a. Surman Ra'a, the full name for Samarra. 
Samarra uh, back in the day used to be known as Sur Man uh, 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 because it was pleasant as a city for uh, anybody to look at uh, it with the greenery yes, and yes. everything. فَاسْتَأَذَنَا بِالدُّخُولِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَذِنَ لَنَا فَدَخَلْنَا عَلَيْهِ صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ فِي مِثْلِ هَذَا الْيَوْمِ وَهُوَ يَوْمُ التَّاسِعِ مِنْ شَهْرِ رَبِيعِ الْأَوَّلِ وَسَيِّدُنَا he says, we entered into the house on a day like this, the 9th of Rabiul Awal, in the previous year or in the previous years. And we saw our master wearing the best of clothes. He had encouraged all his servants and the people in his house, who Imam Al-Hadi, to dress as much as possible in their best clothes. وَكَانَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ مُجَمَّرَ يُحْرِكُ الْعُودَ بِنَفْسِهِ He was lighting the Eid Oud and spreading oh, wow. the Oud by himself. Yani, mm -hmm. Look at the manner in which Imam Al-Hadi is celebrating. Mm -hmm. He's with the Oud and he's spreading the Oud in the house by himself. So we said to him, May our mothers and our fathers be sacrificed for you, Ya Ibn Rasulullah. هَلْ تَجَدَّدَ لِأَحْلِ الْبَيْتِ فِي هَذَا الْيَوْمِ فَرْحِ they said to him, Ya Imam Al-Askari, Ya Mawlana, Ya Sayyidina, did something happen today to renew the happiness of Ahlul Bayt? Mm -hmm. Look at the response of the Imam. He answers the question with another question, rhetorical question. And which other day other than this? Is there a day that has a greater sanctity in regards to Ahlul Bayt? Rhetorical question, he says, Yani, one of the most sanctuous days within the calendar. And then the hadith goes on to state how Imam Al Hadi narrates the incident from. Hudayfa al-Yamani on authority of the Prophet on how the Prophet gave glad tidings that the 9th of Rabiul Awwal is the day where the killer of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra shall perish. So what we understand is that this hadith illustrates for us how Farhat al-Zahra and the celebration of 9th of Rabiul Awwal as a day of Eid from the time of Imam Hassan al-Askari salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi. Mm -hmm. And the greatest companions around the Imam celebrated this Eid. Mashallah. Person may come and the person may say, well before this you mm -hmm. find that a lot of the Shia and perhaps the narrators of these two traditions were not even aware of this Eid. Okay. Which perhaps shows us or is an indication. It's not 100% or... Not we've lost translation. Taqiyya. La uh, taqiyya. Okay. Taqiyya. The Shia never had the chance to openly express themselves or practice their faith with safety and aman. They were never granted that freedom to do so. And it shows us the level of taqiyya. And the person who looks into history will see that this narration and in itself became a turning point to make this celebration one of the most far, most well-known and well-celebrated Eids in the entire Shia history from there on within Shia communities across the globe. If a person looks into history and he sees this transformation, and not to say that this Eid was not celebrated. When you say taqiyya, doesn't mean that somebody within the uh, viewers, respected brothers and sisters, thinks that this Eid was never celebrated until the time of Imam al-Hadi. Oh, La! Wow. Mm -hmm. It was celebrated, but private, probably, yeah. celebrated in a manner where majority of the people were not aware because... There are indications, as we shall discuss later on in the show, that we have hadith not only from Imam al-Hadi in this regard, but hadith going back to Imam Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Asanjala. Shaykh, I think it's, it's really like, uh, if you look in today's uh, society, um, that we do have people who are a little, you know, skeptical in regards to this, these hadith. They're a bit skeptical in order to celebrate 
Farhat and for mm -hmm. whatever reasons. Um, before we go to a break, if you quickly summarize, you know, why, why do you think some people challenge these hadiths? Why do you think some people are trying to, you know, hide or cover Farhat and Zahra in the daylight today? Um, how much time do we have? The answer is in accordance to that. If we have a few minutes before the break, we'll see over here that um, the authenticity of the hadith, uh, there is absolutely no doubt in regards to this. And inshallah, perhaps this is something that we can touch after the break. Yeah. But I think what you are illustrating towards is the concept of Tatweej al-Imam al-Hujjah, Jalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif where the ninth of Rabiul Awwal is marked or is commemorated as the first day of the Imamat of Imam Sahib Al Amr. So it's yeah. a day of celebration, celebrating the Imamat of Imam Al Hujjah. Two ishkals in regards to this, two difficulties or two problems in regards to this. Habibi, number one. Technically, this is incorrect. Ninth of Rabiul Awal was not the first day of the Imamah of Imam Al Hujjah. Rather, the Imamat of Imam Al Hujjah is from the day of the Istishhad of Imam Hassan Al Askari, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, which is the eighth of Rabiul Awal. So, the divine responsibilities of divine leadership. So in terms of executing this authority mm -hmm. because the imam was an imam from even before. Indeed. There is no doubt. It's not that, oh, he was not an imam and now he became an imam. La, he was always an imam. But now this authority of executing the responsibility of this imama, this began from the istishhad of Imam Hassan al-Askari which mashhur within the books of Tariq, 8th of Rabiul Awwal. Mm -hmm. So the 8th of Rabiul Awwal, technically speaking, is the first day of the Imamate of Imam al hujjah It's not the 9th of Rabiul Awwal. Right, this is the first mistake, Ishkal number one. Ishkal number two, Ya Akhi, we have never had <laughs> within the history of Tashayyu that we have celebrated the commencement of the imamate of any imam. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have one celebration. The divine, the taking of the bay'ah in terms mm -hmm. of this announcement of the divine leadership of Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam on Yawm al Ghadir. Which happened before the istishad of Rasulullah. Which happened Ahsantum, 18th of Dil Hijjah. But we don't have celebration within Shia history, the celebration of the beginning of one imamat. Mm -hmm. Yani, yeah, for example, for example, can nobody within the Shia world, can, or even the, from the non Shia, can dispute with you on the fact the hadith of Imam al Hussein, and we spoke about this number of times, and Khutaba always mentioned this. Inna al Hussein, misbahul huda, wa safinatun najat. Imam al Hussein is the savior, is the lantern of guidance and the ark of salvation. Whoever boasts the ark of Imam al Hussein is the ark of Jannah. Yes. We know that, correct? Now, just because Imam al Hussein is the ark of salvation, does it mean, huh? On the istishad of Imam Hassan al Askari, we begin to celebrate the Imamat of Imam al Hussein because he is the Imam that gave us the greatest sacrifice to save humanity. Yahuwah min mantik. This is nonsense. It's a nonsensical argument to be respectful. It's a nonsensical argument. We have never had, the, it's incorrect in terms of a date perspective. The first day of the Imamat of Imam al Hujjah is Rabiul Awal. Number two, it has never been a practice from the practice of the Shia before that we commemorate the beginning of the Imamat of any other Imam in that sense. Number three, and this is the last before we go on to break. If you really think about it, the beginning of the Imamat of Imam al Hujjah, Ya Akhi, should actually be. It's, 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 a gr it's, it's a situation of grief. Ghaybat mm. al-Sukhra began. Yes. Habibi, what is there to celebrate about the beginning of Ghaybat al-Kubra? Mm. He says, the prophets say that they shall come upon a time where because of the Ghaybah, people will go astray. Mm. You don't have physical access to your Imam. The reason that we recite Dua Nudba every Friday is we weep and we wail and we cry. We cannot see the Imam of our time. And now suddenly we want to begin to celebrate the beginning of this Ghaibah. Ya Akhi, 
This is a law. That in itself is uh, incorrect and in many times the excuse or the justification, tatwij, yani the crowning or the beginning of the Imam of Imam al hujja in uh, my humble opinion, uh, is a good cover mm -hmm. okay. for hiding the reality. Uh, Inshallah, Shaykh, we're going to carry on our discussion after the break. So to the viewers, please don't go anywhere and please join us after the break as we continue the discussion. Inshallah, see you after. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa Welcome back to the live Facebook We have a special program to do with Farhat al-Zahra Our phone lines are open so if you do have a question you'd like to ask the Sheikh Please call us on 0203-515-0199 And inshallah the Sheikh will be able to answer the question for you inshallah Sheikh now you gave us a hadith by Ahmed ibn Isaq al-Qummi um, How authentic is this? Is this hadith ever challenged by anyone or anything? In regards to the narration of uh, Ahmad ibn Ishaq al-Qummi, uh, you find that this narration is found within Biharul Anwar, is narrated inside of Biharul Anwar by Alam al-Majlisi rahmatullah alayhi. And um, it's very unfortunate that you have in this day and age that uh, there is this attack on Alam al-Majlisi and then attack on the credibility and the authenticity of uh, this encyclopedia uh -huh. known uh -huh. as Biharul Anwar. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, leaving these misconceptions aside, yani, there is, uh, we have, inshallah, a particular series that is uh, prepared in regards to understanding. You see, with Biharul Anwar as an, en an encyclopedia, there's a manner in which it needs to be studied and a manner in which so before you carry on, I think it's important to um, let the viewers understand how big Bahar Anwar actually is. And I, think I think it's 40 volumes or something. It's, it's, in it's today's humongous. publications, 110 volumes. MashaAllah. In today's publications, 110. You will see some editions where they've put volume 31 and 32 together. So 102 mm -hmm. volumes, 106 volumes all together. Depending wow. on the print, but you can say safely 100 volume. Thick 100 books. volume. Uh, yes, uh, not... What about the hadith inside of these heavyweight hadith, yani Siddiq Biharul Anwar, mm -hmm. uh, truly uh, and uh, an ocean and a sea of lights and nur emanating from uh, within this writing and no other historian before or after or no other scholar before or after has ever been able to even replicate something close to Biharul Anwar. So you have this hadith inside which is mentioned in Biharul Anwar. You find that a number of other scholars have talked about and mentioned this hadith of is, uh, Ahmad ibn Ishaq al-Kummi. Alam al-Majlisi rahmatullah alayhi in the version that I have volume 95. You have Sayyid ibn Tawus in his book Zawaid al-Fawaid. You have Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabari in his book Dala'il al-Imamah. And then you have a fourth scholar by the name of Sheikh Hashim ibn Muhammad who was from the ulama of the 6th century in his book Misbahul Anwar. Okay. So a person might ask who is Hisham ibn Muhammad and what's the importance of this book Kitab Misbahul Anwar. You find that Alama Majlisi Rahmatullah Alaykh in a footnote writes that one of the classical things or the distinguishing factors about the scholar Sheikh Hashim ibn Muhammad in his book Misbahul Anwar Annahu Sheikh Majlisi writes, Alama Majlisi writes Yarwi minal usulul mu'tabara minal khasa wal amma 
that Sheikh Hashim ibn Muhammad in his book Misbahul Anwar had access to those books that are known as the Usulul Mu'tabara, the mm. Usul Arbamiya, for example, 400 core books written under the direct communication of the Imam or supervised under the Imam. So you find that this hadith of Ahmad ibn Ishaq al kummi has roots within the Usul al Mu'tabara. And then on top of that, you have Hashim al Bahrani, the author, Atullah Hashim al Bahrani, the author of Madinatul Ma'ajij, Atullah Sayyid Ni'matullah al Jazairi. So you have six, and there are many more. If you keep going, the number is endless. So this common misconception that this hadith is only narrated by Alama al-Majlisi is incorrect. This same narration has been repeated by grand scholars from within mm. our times and six of them we have just listed them. Another thing is this, when you are looking at authenticity, first of all the narrator of this hadith Ahmad ibn Ishaq al-Kummi is a notable figure and a very well revered figure within Tashayyu, within the Shia school of thought. A companion of Imam al Jawad and Imam al Hadi and Imam al Askari, you find that he is uh, his mazar. He actually has a shrine okay. where it is a place of visitation till today, if I'm not mistaken, in Kerman Shah in Iran. Okay. He was one of those few companions who was blessed to have seen Imam al Hujja during the lifetime of Imam Hassan al Askari. And uh, an author as well from the ulama and the wukala of the 12th imam who was also the author of books. Mm -hmm. And uh, in regards to his credibility, in regards to his credibility, if you are looking at this from a sanad perspective, Sheikh Najashi says, وَكَانَ وَافِدُ الْكُمِّيِّينَ وَرَوَى عَنْ أَبِي جَعْفَرَ الثَّانِي وَأَبِي الْحَسَنِ وَكَانَ خَاصَّةَ أَبِي مُحَمَّدِ He was the face, the head of the delegations of the Kumiyin and narrated hadith on authority of Imam al-Jawad and Imam al-Hadi and was from the Khasat Abi Muhammad. Yani those particular close circles of Imam Hassan al-Asghari. Shaykh al -Tusi, says the same thing khawas abi muhammad wa ra'a sahib zaman wa huwa shaykh al kumiyin wa wafiduhum he was the shaykh of the kumiyin the master the grand scholar of the people of kum and the official you could say representative of the faith and representative of the imam in that sense so this is in uh, in in regards to ahmad ibn ishaq al kummi look now the point that i wanted to get towards when it comes to establishing the authenticity of any given narration, the sanad in itself, the chain of narrators in itself, is not the only criteria for establishing the authenticity of a hadith. It is one of mm -hmm. many ways in which the authenticity of a hadith can be established. We have a concept within usulul hadith which is known, يعني, even if the Sanad has no i'tibar, if the Sanad was weak, da'if, for a number of reasons, a hadith can be da'if in regards to its Sanad because of a number of reasons. Yes. On the assumption that the hadith in itself was da'if, it does not become a reason to negate the authenticity of the hadith in its entirety. Why? Because the hadith in itself can be mahfuf bil qara'in. Mm. It is surrounded, yani it is clustered with a number of so, indicators mm -hmm. that allow us to establish the authenticity of this hadith without any doubt. MashaAllah. Shaykh, I do believe we have a caller on the line, inshallah, we'll be able to get through to them. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Why do we celebrate Fast al Zahra? Uh, you guys are celebrating the death of someone who is revered by the Sunni school of thought. Aren't you causing issues and problems within the Shia Sunni unity? 
Okay, your name, brother, where are you calling from? My name is Amir Sadiq. I'm calling from Nottingham. MashaAllah. Thank you very much, Amir. Thank you for your question. Sheikhna, this Eid, controversial, um, you know, maybe, you know, celebrating the death of someone who may be uh, revered very highly by other schools of thought, um, causing maybe some damage to interfaith relations. Right. See, over here, when it comes to the question whether Farhat al-Zahra causes sectarianism, how do we say no? Why? Because this entire deen is built on a system of truth and haq. Indeed. You have haq and you have batil. If we say on the premise that, for example, this Eid, when you look at the titles that is given to this day of Eid by Amirul Mu'mineen, it is the day of justice. It is the day of divine chastisement. Ya'ni, for us the Shia, this is a day of celebration because it is a day of justice. The person who oppressed, the person who persecuted, the person who assaulted the daughter of the Holy Prophet, Abu Hafsa, broke her ribs, caused the death of her unborn child. This was the day where he carried out all these tragedies and these atrocities. What gave him that jur'ah? What gave mm -hmm. him that courage to attack the daughter of the Prophet in this way? Because they felt that they were not accountable to anyone. They felt that they were above any sort of accountability. Mm -hmm. And because the Ahlul Bayt and the Shia were patient, and they said that if vengeance cannot be taken here, then there is a day where every oppressor shall be judged and shall be held accountable for the crimes that they committed on this earth. And therefore, the celebration has nothing to do with causing sectarianism. Rather, this is a day of celebrating divine justice against those who oppress the daughter of the Holy Prophet. This is a day of hope for everyone who is oppressed till today. That wherever you are in the world, my dear brother, my dear sister, if you are being oppressed and above you, those who are oppressing you are powers who are so arrogant, who behave as if they are the pharaohs of this earth, do not lose hope. Do not lose Hope in God, do not lose hope in justice, do not lose hope in freedom. Because God has shown us by way of ninth Rabiul Awwal, every oppressed person shall one day gain justice for all the crimes and oppressions carried out against him. Mm -hmm. So I would say to you, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, if there are misconceptions in the regards to why we celebrate Farhat al-Zahra, if it is offending other people, I would say to you this offense. To for a large number of people, it's because they don't know the reality of what happened to Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra. Okay. There is no single Muslim who prays today who would tell you that he doesn't love the daughter of Rasulullah. We are not talking about people who are devious and have agendas or who know the truth but refuse to acknowledge the truth. La, mm. These people are there and they are a minority. Misguided, misinformed. Minority. The large, vast majority mm. of the population, these are people, <coughs> very good-natured people, very kind-hearted people. And it doesn't mean we sever ties with them. Abadan la. They don't know. They are either misinformed or there is a picture of this individual that is drawn for them as being pious and the leader of the Muslims. But if mm. they were to know the media propaganda that went behind it and the reality of how he usurped the right of Amir al muminin and how he assaulted the daughter of the Prophet, nobody would come and condemn you mm -hmm. for taking this day of celebration. The reason that we have injustice and bloodshed within this ummah 
We can have our speculations, we can have our reasons, but if we want to analyze the cause of bloodshed in the Ummah today, as per the words of Ahlul Bayt, then I go back to the khutbah of Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen yes. in the khutbah of Adakiyah, where she clearly stated that the effect of these this, uh, this usurpation of the Khilafah of Amirul Mu'mineen is going to cause bloodshed within the Ummah. Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam foretold this. Mm -hmm. So therefore, one of the greatest ways or one of the most important ways, steps that need to be taken in order to have and restore the glory of Islam is to come back to the original teachings of Rasulullah and to be able to be brave enough to say, that yes, this crime happened, this was wrong. To be brave enough to embrace the truth. Why should there be an element of violence in this? Mm -hmm. Do the Shia carry arms on the 9th of Rabiul Awwal? Do they go out with weapons for expressing their faith and celebrating their faith? Why should we be the target of attacks? And then the attacked is condemned for expressing his voice and the attacker walks free. What type of logic is this? It should not cause any tension, any sectarianism. We need to educate the masses on the reality of what has happened and the reality of this history. If a person comes and says that this is causing sectarianism, Ya Habibi, Rasulullah celebrated this Eid. Imam Hassan al-Askari celebrated this Eid. Does it mean that Imam Hassan al-Askari promoted sectarianism? Abadan la. We have to stand up in a manner that is loving, in a manner that has logic, in a manner that has dalil and proof to show the people why exactly we're celebrating. No one should be offended from this because it's a celebration of justice. The daughter was oppressed, the daughter of the Prophet was oppressed on this earth. She couldn't, she, they, they took, they couldn't stand up against him. They controlled themselves and they adapted. The stance of sabr. But they knew that this dunya is not the end. This dunya is not the ultimate. There is a world and a realm of existence greater than this dunya. And a person who oppresses you over here, he will get his awesome. according punishment accordingly. Awesome. And you see, this is something that is, yani, uh, this is something that is very logical in the sense that it is a day of celebrating justice and a day of celebrating uh, hope for the oppressed. Indeed. And uh, there is no sectarianism in both these concepts. Rather, both these concepts using the aql is something that is mahboob. It is something that is loved and is something that is respected and stood up for Indeed. in that sense. I mean, you can't even blame um, Iraqis who were celebrating the death of Saddam. And when Saddam was punished and executed, there was millions that took to the streets celebrating and, and, and um, you know, uh, I kind of like you know, being happy about their freedom and that this dictator and such a uh, oppressor had, right. had, had been killed. Um, and, and likewise, I mean, do you think that, you know, people get offended with other celebrations such as, they say, you know, when Father's Day or Mother's Day come, you know, there are those couples that, you know, um, have issues because there is no mother in that couple or there is no father in that couple. Right. And they find that offensive. Or those awesome. who do... Um, we had Memorial Day the other day uh, right. in regards to the First World War. Right. Uh, you know, with, with the, the French, the British, the Russians versus uh, Germans, Austrians, uh, Italians. Um, I mean, th obviously, there was a lot of people that lost their lives. Of it was course. a very, very sensitive topic, but there were still commemorations in regards people to People commemorate this. that. And you see, th th this is a valid point, Yani. You see, th all these show us um, the underlying problems that we have within the Muslim Ummah. Our understanding of sectarianism, it needs to be taken. Do we take our understanding of sectarianism from the media, from other people's personal mm -hmm. opinions? Should we take the definition of sectarianism from the Quran and the Hadith? If we call ourselves Muslims, we need to go back to the Quran and the Hadith. What is the definition of sectarianism? Mm -hmm. If This is one. Number two, if it's the issue of offense. Ya Akhi, when Rasulullah said, La ilaha illallah. Enter when you say, La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. Do you know how offensive that statement is to millions of people on earth right now today? Yes. Does it mean I stop saying La ilaha illallah in my shahada? <laughs> La, this is again, this is khilaf mantik. This is against the logic. Like you rightly said, Father's Day. We celebrate Father's Day today. Mm -hmm. Does that mean if we celebrate Father's Day, it is offensive 
for those children who were born out of wedlock and don't know who their fathers are. Mm -hmm. So in order to not offend them, we should stop celebrating Father's Day. God forbid the orphans. There are so many orphans that uh, with the orphans the, the, we celebrate Father's Day or yes. Mother's Day. Does that mean that we are actually uh, taunting them or mocking them? No. Nobody says this. Rather, you use that Father's Day to show extra love and extra care to the orphans in the same way to for the Farat al-Zahra. You take extra care to educate people on the reality of this passion and how we oppress the daughter of the Holy Prophet. Same thing with Independence Day. A beautiful example you threw, Sayyid Mosul. <laughs> and with the, uh, regardless of Baba, we're not talking about whether the war was right or wrong and our Indeed. stance of Islam against violence. La, la, la. It's nothing like that. But does it mean? But just, just because, for example, we celebrated Memorial Day. Yes, Remembrance Day. That, or a couple of Sundays Remembrance ago, Day. Yeah. That the countries who are on the other side of the war get offended. Do mm -hmm. they come and they say, no, why did you celebrate? What is it? Remembrance or Memorial Day? And it's the same thing. This same is thing. <laughs> okay. Remembrance Day. Why did you guys celebrate Remembrance Day? Yeah, or where the puppy. Or, or where yeah. the puppy. It's offensive to us and that we should sever diplomatic yes. ties. No, they don't say that. The same thing could be said with the Independence Day. Yes. Independence Day, the <laughs> countries that were colonized by the British, British. Empire. Yes. Independence Day celebrates what? They were engaged in war and they broke out from the control of the British, U yeah. European, the colonialist powers. Yes. There, for example, Pakistan, Independence yes. Day. <laughs> Pakistan, <laughs> India, but at Kenya. Kenya Indeed. was also yeah, a yeah, British colony. colony. Yes, Kenya was a British Indeed. colony. Does that mean that if I be a patriotic, I celebrate Independence Day for Kenya, that means I'm waging mm -hmm. war against the British or it will be offensive to the British because it denotes the fall of their empire and a revolt of the Kenyan people against the British soldiers and God knows mm -hmm. how much blood was shed. Indeed. Nobody says this. It's a holiday that is celebrated. Indeed. They celebrate Independence Day, the break away from British rule. And at the same time, they have diplomatic ties with, <laughs> with yes, Britain with the, in yes. that sense. So the idea, of, the argument of it being offensive is an argument that is not logical. That a person stops an act or a faith because the other person is offensed with this. What needs to happen is that we need to create a culture of dialogue and a culture of acceptance. At the end of the day, everybody brings forward their dalil and their proof. The one who is convinced, Alhamdulillah, the one who is not convinced is not convinced. You celebrate, you see him as a person who is condemned to hell. You have this person who sees him as going to heaven. Yalla, you deal the way you want or behave the way you want, celebrate the way you want and you celebrate the way you want. Indeed. And it shouldn't lead to bloodshed. This is what we are saying. Freedom of expression in that sense. So, subhanallah, and you see all of this from the barakat coming out of Farhat al-Zahra sure, where these discussions can be made in, in a non-violent manner and in a manner with uh, dalil. This is our I, biggest I think thing. It's, it's very important also that we understand that there are differences. Um, and, and for example, there are those that we revere very highly and, and the other schools of thought say that they're kufr and they're going to hell. Of course. You know? they, so it's, it's both ways. But we don't, we don't, I don't, I've never seen Shia jump and shout and scream in regards to that. You have your faith and we have our faith and we have a differences and we can always tolerate and be respectful to one another. This is it, the definitions of tolerance. And the important thing is that, Baba, the stances have to be non-violent. Indeed. Non-violence. Why should these celebrations lead to the violence of others? There are those who celebrate the birth of multiple gods now we believe in the existence of one God. It's the biggest insult against Allah. God to be born. <laughs> yeah, Baba. But <laughs> does that mean we go and we stop them from celebrating because you are offending my faith? No, we don't say that. This is your belief. It's a celebrate. When the time comes and the doors of ideological debate and ideological discussion is open and the concept of how we should live our lives and the concept of what is the ultimate one single truth that will guarantee us paradise? We can sit on the table and we can have discussions. But more than that, you cannot force your belief on somebody else. And neither can anybody else or does anybody else have the right to force their faith on you. 
we can be open to discussion the whole goal comes back over here and it underlines our ethos and our belief that's the practice of non-violence awesome. thank you very much Sheikh for tonight's discussion it's been you've cleared up a lot of misconceptions and a lot of misunderstanding alhamdulillah and to all the viewers i hope you enjoyed the discussion inshallah we'll be back again with uh, more theological debates coming from uh, and the theological arguments coming from the book Haqqal Yaqeen insha'Allah. Until then, I hope you enjoyed the show and I hope you enjoyed your uh, Eid, Farhat al-Zahra. Uh, bidding you farewell. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Allahumma al-an. Ada'al Ahlul Bayt. Insha'Allah. May God curse all of the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt and Rasulullah, especially those who attacked the door of Zahra. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Oh